What's the title of your most recent book and what's it about? Hmm. Technocracy Rising. Subtitle, The Trojan Horse of Global Transformation. Transformation is a buzzword today in the, the global elite circles. That's what's happening to our world. And uh, Technocracy Rising is about the, literally about the rise of uh, technocracy, replacement economic system from the 1930s uh, to sweep across the entire world. Why did you write the book? I wrote Technocracy Rising because it had to be written. It was a topic that was uh, virtually unknown. The historical movement of technocracy was largely undiscovered in modern times. And yet when I discovered it had tremendous significance to uh, current affairs, I knew that uh, the story absolutely had to be written. And this was in, in lieu somewhat of my idea of writing a final book, Trilaterals Over Washington, Volume 3, which would have completed a trilogy. But I decided not to do that, that this uh, story of technocracy was much, much more important than merely describing the actions, uh, the current actions of the Trilateral Commission, you know, bringing things up to date in the last 40 years and so on. And it does all that in addition in, my, in the book, Technocracy Rising. But uh, I do believe that the concept of technocracy in today's modern world is the singular most important concept that people have missed and also that people need to get a hold of. How would you define freedom? Freedom. Well, freedom and liberty are closely related topics. And some people would define freedom as just the ability to do whatever the heck you want to do. And I suppose there's merit in that as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else and you don't uh, and, uh, you know, intrude on another person's rights uh, to freedom as well. But I think in a larger context, freedom in a society has a different con little bit different concept than a freedom as an individual. We certainly need freedoms as individuals. The Constitution and the uh, Declaration of Independence guarantees it to us. But in a societal sense, uh, freedom and liberty have the context of uh, being able to operate together and live in the same, you know, live in close proximity to each other, to monitor the affairs of society in such a way that people have uh, a maximized uh, number of choices on what they can do with their lives, what they want to do with their lives, uh, the right to self-determination as either a family or as an individual or as a group of people. Um, without uh, tromping on the, the rights of other people and damaging their property, damaging their, their ability to, to do what they want to do. And there's limits to that. Uh, for instance, if people come into society and want to destroy that society altogether by force, uh, for instance, the recent ISIS attacks down in, attack down in Texas is a good case in point, uh, should, we allow, uh, should we allow people like ISIS to, to exercise free speech in our country? Uh, if that speech is specifically designed to destroy our country? Uh, I think not. That personally, I think not. Uh, but liberty and freedom are, are things that are ingrained in the constitution of our nation. They're ingrained, I believe, in our heritage. We've had lots of close calls over the decades uh, where uh, it looked like it was going to be curtains, yet it wasn't, and we're still here. What's the most important concept to realize in terms of technocracy for an average reader of your book? The most important and, and shocking part of technocracy is that it's not a political system. It was defined as an economic system. It's a, it's a big difference here. Now, obviously, economics and politics are closely related in some sense. But our political system in our country, our public, uh, based on a Congress, based on a Senate, and a House of Representatives, executive branch being separate from Congress, the judiciary being separate from both. Um, we have a political system in our country that, that uh, appropriately supports the economic system that we know as free enterprise and, and kind of a larger sense as capitalism. Uh, not to be confused, by the way, with crony capitalism or other aberrations of capitalism. But um, the economic system is different than the political system. And technocracy was defined originally in the 1930s as an economic system, not as a political system. Uh, these scientists and engineers that started this uh, eschewed the political system in our country. They didn't like politicians. They felt they had no need, that they were blundering idiots, uh, trying to control and make policies for technology that they did not understand. 
In fact, they blamed the Great Depression on these same politicians because they felt that they had uh, done things with technology and society that resulted in everything falling apart. That was a false read, by the way, on their part, I do believe. But uh, nevertheless, that's the way they felt back then. And there's a general feeling of that today, that uh, the political structure of this country is immaterial. Uh, you know, the Congress is irrelevant. And that the scientists and engineers should just simply do what's right in their own eyes to manage and control society at large. And it's also important to remember that when we talk about the economic system versus political system, that technocracy is a global movement today. It's not just centered in America. We have a particular um, uh, political system in our country, but other countries don't have our system. Uh, for instance, China is, uh, still has the vestiges of a communist dictatorship, a totalitarian dictatorship in this country. And yet, uh, China is now being classified by many writers as a pure technocracy. They're going in that direction of an economic system uh, based on the, the original technocracy that we find in the 1930s, an economic system. Uh, in fact, uh, technocracy as a historical system works better in a totalitarian system, government, a form of government, than it would in a, uh, in a democratic or republican form of government that we have here in America. So looking at it as an economic system, it's covering the globe with a, with a common interest, uh, and yet there are many different, many different political systems and systems of governance throughout the world that aren't the same, it's not the same as ours. Uh, Europe is different, Russia is different, China is different, the uh, countries in South America and, and, and Africa and so on have quite varied forms of governance of the people. It's an economic coup that's taking place in the world today, an economic transformation. And the people that are bringing this to us want to uh, control society, uh, if you will, as a, as a factory, kind of like a factory or a machine floor where you have a factory making something and um, the engineers have designed the factory and they're going to uh, you know, manage every little uh, part of the factory uh, from, from their perspective as a, as a scientific project. Crazy as it sounds, it's social engineering on steroids. It sounds like Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Well, somewhat. Uh, there's been lots of, uh, lots of descriptions of utopia over the last, uh, I'll say, 100 years. And um, they all fit to some extent. Um, uh, technocracy, as originally uh, described in the, in the 1930s, truly was a utopian system of operation. Um, we have an example in, in literature uh, of the book Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Uh, Huxley's book, scary as it was, science, science fiction knowledge that proposed a, or that described a scientific dictatorship where every little facet of life was managed uh, down to the, the last little detail. And what people don't appreciate is that that book was written in 1932. The only thing on the world stage at that point that even remotely fit that book was technocracy, and he was looking into the face of technocracy when he wrote the book. He got his inspiration from it. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to turn out exactly that way, but you hear it today in the, in the media, and you hear people talking about it just in passing. Oh, it's a brave new world we live in these days. You know, well, they don't realize how true that is. The brave new world that they're talking about was looking straight into the face of technocracy in the 1930s, and those ideas have stuck and they're striking a chord with people today. They're not sure why, but those that have read the book say, oh man, it sure looks like Brave New World to me. <laughs> well, Huxley, if you go forward with his brother Julian, you've got UNESCO and the Humanist Manifesto. Uh, he was co-author of that, I thought, in 1933, uh, the United Nations. Uh, so that's eugenics, that's British eugenics going forward. And if you went backwards in his history, you've got T.H. Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog. So around technocracy, you've got this whole idea of eugenics. You've got Fabian socialists. There's a lot of common threads running through there. And I can't help but notice the, the parallels between 1932, Brave New World, and a 1919 novel from a guy named uh, Yevgeny Zemyatin in Russia. So he kind of, there was other parts of the world that were kind of also describing how there's a certain group of scientists who are seeking to control population and uh, different artists were writing that. Now, I think uh, Brave New World was definitely written from a position of this is a foreshadowing of what they wanted to do. And uh, Aldous Huxley was the teacher of H.G. or not H.G. Wells. He was 
tutor of Aldous Huxley, Huxley's student was Orwell. So there's also an ominous chain of continuity between uh, Darwin, the Huxleys, H.G. Wells, uh, George Orwell, and all these uh, caricatures, if you will, of tyranny that got brought about into his formalized course. How would you define technocracy? Well, as a replacement economic system, the differentiator was that they wanted to do away with price-based economics altogether, and that means capitalism. They wanted to destroy capitalism. Well, actually, they didn't want to destroy it. They just believed it was already dead. The, the Great Depression uh, was a very dark time. Uh, unemployment was through the roof. Uh, food lines, you know, extending around blocks. Um, uh, finding a job was just next to impossible. A lot of hunger, uh, a, lot of di a lot of just hard times. And so... A lot of people really believed capitalism was dead. And the thing that differentiated technocracy from anything else was that the scientists and engineers believed that the perfect economy would be based on energy rather than on money and supply and demand. This is a very difficult concept for people in America or probably anywhere to get their, their head around because when you, when you talk about doing it with money and pricing everything in energy, it just doesn't make sense. It goes snap. But here's, here's the, uh, just an example of how, how it might work. Um, they would forecast, uh, they intended to forecast the amount of energy that was going to be produced in any given period, like say a month. They would forecast the energy to be produced in that given month in the economic system that was being looked at. They would divide that energy by the number of people, and they would devise a system of energy currency, energy credits that would be passed out, kind of like food stamps, to everybody in society. And you'd have those energy credits to spend during the following month. At the end of the month, your energy credits would expire if you had not spent them. So, it's, you know, spend them or lose them. Um, and you'd have to wait for a new allocation for the, for the following month, again, based on, on another forecast of the energy that's going to be produced in that period. Then on the other hand, how would you buy goods and services? Well, you go down to the, uh, let's say, go down to a clothing store to buy a shirt. Um, the uh, technocrats, the science and engineers, believed that they would be able to price that shirt in terms of the energy that it took to make it. So you have cotton grown in Egypt, you have uh, diesel goes into a tractor, you have uh, the cotton gin comes along and has to spin it into thread, and then it goes to a garment maker in Sri Lanka, and another ship involved, and eventually it ends up in your store, uh, wherever your town is, in a department store, and you go in and buy the shirt. Theoretically, there's, uh, you, could, you could add up all the energy it took to make that shirt. That's what you'd pay. And it uh, wouldn't be based on supply and demand at all. It'd just be based on the amount of energy it took to make that shirt. So this is completely otherworldly to our system uh, that we understand as free enterprise, supply and demand, and so on. Um, and it also requires a management of the economy that we do not appreciate today at all. We don't have anything like this in today's economic world. Now, there have been attempts to manage capitalism in different ways, by the way. I, I'll say that um, the Bolshevik Revolution, for instance, when communism really uh, really got underway as a, as a social experiment, uh, the government attempted to manage the capitalistic system. Uh, same thing happened with, with fascism. Well, the corporate world merged with the government, and they tried to, man they tried to manage the economy. But in both cases, it was still a price-based economy. It was still supply and demand, even though the government said, we'll manage the economy. We'll, t we'll tell you how much supply there's going to be. We'll tell you how much demand there can be. And um, uh, when technocracy came along, uh, the whole concept uh, of, of all of those things were out the door. It was an altogether different ballgame. Uh, in fact, if, if you were to meet a card-carrying technocrat in the 1930s and call him a communist, you're liable to get into a fist fight with them because they hated communism. They thought that communism was a complete sellout. That was just another iteration of capitalism and, you know, people trying to manage and, and manipulate capitalism to, you know, control the people. Technocracy, they thought, would do away with that altogether. What was the technocracy study course at King's College, New York? Uh, the technocracy study course um, became the technocrats Bible, if you will, for how they intended to transform the world into a, a technocracy economic system. It was written primarily by a young geophysicist by the name of M. King Hubbard. Um, the other co-founder of Technocracy Incorporated was a guy by the name of Howard Scott. Um, and I might add, even though Technocracy Incorporated was started in 1934, 
the movement towards that end had covered at least the 20 years prior. There was lots of discussion that went on, uh, lots of little groups that met. Um, technocracy as an ideology really got its kickstart when they became associated with Columbia University in 1932, in early 1933. And uh, several of the prominent engineers and scientists at Columbia were actually part of technocracy at that point. Uh, only until uh, Howard Scott was uh, exposed as being somewhat of a fraud did Columbia University drop kick them literally right out of the university, said, get out, don't come back. And uh, so there was a little time of turmoil there. Both Howard Scott and M. King Hubbard, uh, they happened to be roommates at the time because Scott was broke. Um, they, uh, they got together the next year and they started this organization called Technocracy Incorporated. It was a membership organization. They, they incorporated in New York. Both their signatures were on the incorporation papers. And then they proceeded to spread the, the gospel, if you will, of technocracy far and wide. In order to do that, they knew that they had to document their economic system. They did so through the technocracy study course. It was a, um, um, a eight and a half by 11 type booklet, uh, meant to be a workbook for people to use and study groups around the country, and they did. Um, but they went to great lengths to describe uh, exactly how technocracy would work. And that book is still around even today. You can find it, scanned copies of it on the internet, and you can also buy it still, uh, still being produced by, in fact, Technocracy Incorporated is still alive, it's still incorporated today. Their headquarters happens to be up in the very, very northern part of Washington State, close to the Canadian border. I visited there and got some information from them, actually. Uh, so the organization is still around. The, booklet, the book is still around, Technocracy Study Course. And as I said, there's, there's also a scanned version out there on the internet that uh, people can get and read if they're, if they're curious. In what ways, if there are any ways, does the, technoc does the Technocracy Study Course relate to today's mass surveillance culture? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, the, you know, the, the, the specifications of technocracy included control over energy, um, much like we have smart grid today, with the smart meters that are going on the sides of homes and businesses all over America, and indeed all over the world. Um, you have the total awareness society uh, today with all of the breakdown in personal privacy and uh, the roll up of uh, consumer data, if you will, into massive databases like are being collected by the NSA and others. And um, uh, we see all of, the, all of the genesis of these ideas back in the original technocratic uh, technocracy documents. Uh, the problem is they did not have the technology at the time to do what they wanted to do, and I think they knew that. Uh, it was just an idea, uh, the idea of utopia, that they felt that technology eventually would bail them out. Uh, it didn't happen maybe quite as fast as they thought, but here we are today, and we see these things being implemented today almost in lockstep with the original document. Um, we also had evidence uh, uh, to uh, support the fact that technocracy, when it was housed at Columbia University for a short period of time, uh, shared the basement uh, in Hamilton Hall. There was only one hall back then at Columbia. It was called Hamilton Hall but it had a full uh, footprint basement to the building. And they used that for temporary projects to like loan to people, if you will, that wanted to do something to come in. And um, so they gave uh, technocracy part of that basement space to operate for a time. Um, the other side of that space uh, was occupied by IBM, the early vestiges of IBM. Uh, ostensibly that's where they built uh, one of their very first tabulators. And so there was an interaction between people like M. King Hubbard, who was a geophysicist, trained, educated geophysicist, um, and the computer science guys that were developing this, uh, this tabulator. And so I expect there were some futuristic discussions between those people, like, well, where is computing going? What can we do with it? And when, when the, the rise of um, Nazi Germany uh, National Socialism began to take place in Europe. Uh, IBM was one of the very first vendors that went to uh, that went to the German government and sold or leased. Actually, they never sold anything. They leased many of their tabulators 
uh, to the German government uh, for the sake of doing statistical analysis and things like that, scheduling trains and other, other nefarious things. And um, it wasn't by a surprise either that technocracy also jumped the Atlantic Ocean and showed up in Nazi Germany as well. Um, not necessarily hand in hand with IBM, but you know they were they 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 had some of the shared blood and ideas, if you will. I think by the time they actually just you know got out of Columbia University and went beyond it, um, there's very little evidence at this point, unfortunately, of those early days of IBM at Columbia University. Even though we know they were there, the archives of the the historical archives have been removed from the Columbia library system, so nobody knows where they are <laughs> at this point. Well, what I'm hearing is that there's a, an organization that has jumped national boundaries that was interested in uh, at least analyzing uh, the human resources, natural resources on the planet. And they had, um, they had aims that they couldn't, they couldn't really do through technology yet. And now, that, when you were talking about that, it reminds me of a book that Brzezinski wrote, um, USA and USSR, and it was comparing the two cultures. And in there, he was talking about his experience studying East Germany. And he said they were able to collect massive amounts of information on people, which is cybernetics, but they weren't able to put it into use because they lacked the technical power then. He was predicting then in 19, I think this book was 72 maybe, that this is what they needed to do to go forward. So a lot of the tenets that I see in Brzezinski's work are also found in the technocracy study course mm -hmm. and Brzezinski went to Columbia and there's also this undertone of not only sharing that information the technocracy vibe with the Germans the Nazis but there's also the like eugenics record office that was inspiring some of the talks that Hitler gave mm -hmm. so there's also this uh, you know people who seek to control other people there's a lot of various means that are used to do that but it seems like technocracy was a way to join all those ways and for people to use reason in unreasonable ways mm -hmm. Yes, there was. Um, the The whole field of eugenics really got its start in earnest in California. <laughs> kind of figures, you know, I guess. California seems to lead the way on everything. <laughs> and uh, Hitler actually modeled a lot of his eugenics program after California's eugenics program. I found no evidence, however, that the people involved in technocracy were directly involved in the eugenics movement, except just by simple overlap. Um, it wasn't nearly as big, for instance, at Columbia University as it was in California at that time. However, the, you know, time-wise, the eugenics movement overlapped technocracy perfectly. And so it's, it's certain that some of the technocrats, at least, probably were also very heavily into the eugenics movement as well. Uh, but not as an organizational issue, you know, they understand. They never wrote about it. For instance, technocracy study course uh, doesn't really address Eugenics head, eugenics head on. Um, but some of the people involved in it may well have written some things outside, you know, in their own time, if you will, about the eugenics movement. But they fit quite well, uh, hand in glove, I might add, because, you know, managing uh, from a scientist perspective, an engineer's perspective, managing society uh, to them is a lot like managing a um, a giant feedlot of cattle, you know, say you have 50,000 cattle and all these pens and you have to mix food for them scientifically, you know, you've got all the bins and uh, you, you load the food on the truck and you take it out and deliver it just in time for breakfast and lunch and dinner and snacks in between so they get nice and fat, you know. And um, uh, they, you know, the cattle get weighed, the cattle get, uh, they get shot up with uh, different, uh, you know, drugs and antibiotics or whatever. Um, but you know the whole process is to get the to get those cattle in that feedlot to the to the uh, you know to the market uh, ultimately to be butchered turned into steaks and and hamburger and so on. Um, not that they're trying to make food out of us. That's not what I'm saying. But this is the way a feedlot is managed. You you have to have means of control and monitoring of that feedlot in order to be a good feedlot operator. And so that's a it's an engineering problem. And so. The engineers that looked at society and said, hey, this is just, you know, looks just like a big old factory floor to us, or it looks like a big old feedlot or whatever, um, it begs to be managed. And so we'll use our scientific uh, prowess and our scientific method to figure out ways to engineer society and, uh, you know, make, make it much more efficient. You hear the word efficiency all the time in their writings. Um, and make sure that uh, the resources are balanced, that we don't uh, strip the earth dry of all its natural resources. 
Uh, this is what we hear in sustainable development today, everywhere you turn. Um, as you know, it's about conserving resources and so on, balancing resource usage to consumption or to uh, manufacture. Um, so you know, it's a, it's um, uh, it, 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 it's kind of a uh, it, it's kind of a strange historical animal that had no institutional backing at the time, other than Columbia University, that Rockefellers didn't give money, Carnegies didn't give money, the Mallards didn't give money. There was nobody that I saw around technocracy originally, other than the scientists and engineers doing it, that had any money. And both the founders, uh, Howard Scott uh, was dead broke, and so was uh, basically was M. King Hubbard, um, although at least Hubbard had, a, had enough money to pay for an apartment where uh, Scott roomed for some time because he was broke. Um, so they had no grants, you know, they were just people with radical ideas. There was lots of radical ideas floating around in the 19, you know, 10 through 1935. They had their piece of it. They had their little flag in the ground. And it wasn't until Brzezinski came along in 1970 writing his book, Between Two Ages, uh, subtitled America's Role in the Technotronic Era. Uh, it wasn't until that book came out that uh, technocracy, if you will, was reborn, uh, reinvigorated. I don't know how you'd call it. it um, um, you know, but the themes and the patterns in, in Brzezinski's book very closely uh, mirrored early technocracy. And I don't think it was a mistake that he was at Columbia University at that time. Uh, not that he was indoctrinated by old scientists or something directly, but um, radical ideas tend to be discussed for a long period of time. And I'm sure that there were, uh, in his stay there, I am sure that there were some interesting discussions in the cafeteria over the history of Columbia, you know, the crazy stuff that had come and gone and and, you know, so people are going to be talking potentially about technocracy and the ideas of it. Brzezinski was a political scientist. I'm sure that interested him. And uh, the history of it was right under his nose, too. So why not, why not take a look at it? So I think a lot of those ideas were picked up by Brzezinski. And now discovering technocracy 40 years later and looking backwards to see how they've implemented it, this is exactly what's been in their mind to do from day one when they originally called it, when the Trilateral Commission called it their new international economic order. We didn't understand what that meant at first. Um, but that was it. This is it. Technocracy. All these years later, is there any other legacy left behind by M. King Hubbard in the form of the greed agenda? What was his specific, uh, what was his specific theory? Yeah, Hubbard was interesting, an interesting guy. That's not to be confused in any way with L. Ron Hubbard, by the way. It's spelled differently. There's no relation... Um, they're, uh, yeah, the, the names are completely different. Hubbard. Hubbard, Hubbard and Hubbard. Right. <laughs> so M. King Hubbard was a geophysicist and he left the Technocracy Inc. movement, um, but never renounced technocracy. Uh, he left it, I think, because as he went to work in the corporate world, you know, for the big oil companies and stuff, that it really didn't uh, help his career to be part of Technocracy Inc. Incorporated. So he left the movement, but he never left the philosophy. Uh, it, was, it was Hubbard who in 1954 uh, created the theory or proposed the theory, uh, what we know today as peak oil theory. Uh, it was more often called Hubbard's peak in those days. And he, he talked about it, wrote about it quite prolifically. And basically stated that uh, the reserves in the world were going to max out, oil reserves are gonna max out, that there's a finite limit to them and that the consumption of energy was going to increase, and at some point those curves would cross, and then all heck would break loose because uh, energy, would, uh, energy production would decline, energy usage would increase, and um, uh, you know, this was really kind of the first uh, uh, strong, strong suggestion of what happens uh, if there's an imbalance between consumption and production. But that is of the, what the Earth has to provide in any case. Um, Hubbard uh, didn't know it maybe at the time, but later he became one of the founders, uh, you know, the fathers of the faith, so to speak, of the eco movement. Uh, the whole business of, um, you know, conserving Earth's resources, sustainable development, those sorts of things. And almost any movements you look at that have to do with the, with the ecology, you'll find them taking or giving credit to, to people like uh, M. King Hubbard. Uh, as being one of their founding, 
you know, philo members, uh, you know, philosophy members. And uh, so Herbert, uh, Herbert finally passed, uh, and uh, his legacy lives on today. Before Hubbard, there was a, a British character named Jan Smuts who wrote a book called Holism and Evolution. How would that play into today's green agenda? Well, the concept of holism, uh, as proposed by Smuts, was um, it wasn't officially incorporated uh, as a doctrine, if you will, into early technocracy writings, but the concept had influence over I think almost universally over all the people that were part of technocracy. It's just that they didn't write about it and include it in the doctrine per se. But the idea of holism uh, as proposed by Smuts is that, that each person, uh, each entity, a societal entity is a member of a larger societal entity as well. Like an individual is part of a family, a family is part of a community, a community is part of a town, a town is part of a district, so on up the line, part of the state, states are part of nations, nations are part of the global planet. And Smuts proposed that, that no matter where you were in this holonic structure, that your real responsibility was to the greater holon, the greater, uh, the greater uh, entity that you were part of, um, all the way to the to the planetary level. You know that you were part of that that great holon in the earth. I'd say the great holon in the sky, but the great holon in the earth, I guess. And so a person didn't um, find his identity and his value as a person but only as um, uh, the, the value would come only in his relation to the other holons above him. This is antithetic to the way we think in America where our Declaration of Independence very clearly says that we as people have intrinsic value just because we're human, just because we're born, you know, born human with unalienable rights and um, that we don't have a responsibility to quote unquote serve the greater good, rather we are guaranteed things like the you know the pursuit of life, uh, you know life, liberty, and happiness, the pursuit of happiness, and um, so um, uh, the idea of Smuts um, holarchy really struck a chord with all of these progressive groups, and I think in particular probably with technocracy. Because as they set up their system, it very much mimicked this, this holarchy system where you had all the different components being, you know, serving the greater components above them uh, until you get to the, uh, in fact, even the organizational chart, um, uh, you know, very, that, that is the, the, the technocracy organizational chart of the North American continent uh, resembled the, the, the holon idea where everybody down on the lower and the ladder would serve the people above. It's a dangerous concept, a dangerous philosophy. Uh, we see it all around us today in, in various forms. Movies have been made uh, supporting this idea. Uh, where'd they get the idea? I don't know if they read Smuts, but it's just everywhere, you know, it's all around us. Well, and, and some of the other ideas that had uh, taken root in Germany aside from technocracy, uh, we're creating one of the worst periods in 20th century history. And so it's not just, you know, their use of technology to try to govern and control people. There's also some corrupt reasoning. There, you know, some racist philosophy. There's a, it's like a melting pot. It's like it was somebody's experiment that they couldn't conduct in their own country. And so you had American and British and I'm sure other countries that were contributing to the corporate infrastructure underneath of Nazi Germany, like IBM. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, can you? Is there anything else you have to offer on the the Nazis' use of technocracy? Because then my next question is going to go toward technocracy and Operation Paperclip. Right, right. Yeah, technocracy in Germany was interesting. Uh, the the Germans are much. They're very different than Americans. Uh, it's this understatement. But Germans have always had an idea of um, if it's not invented here, it doesn't exist. <laughs> And when technocracy became a viable movement in Germany, uh, there was a number of people, engineers and scientists, that, that adhered to technocracy. They repented. They weren't organizationally connected to the American counterpart, but 
they reprinted all the articles from the journals over here. They translated and reprinted them in German. So there was obviously, uh, you know, they were in sync with each other, even if they weren't organizationally connected. Um, but the organization of technocracy ran afoul with Hitler uh, when he finally realized that he just really didn't want any other organizations around that might upstage him. So he basically just outlawed the, the technocracy organization. I'm sure he just viewed it as competition. Competition's a sin. But that did not stop the technocrats from operating within Nazi Germany over the, over the, the entire course of the war. Um, there, this was never recognized until recently, uh, a German historian, uh, at a, at a German university and wrote a book. I can't, the name of the book slips from me right now, but he wrote a book and suggested that these technocrats had a profound impact on Hitler's Germany, uh, you know, all during the period, the bad period of time when things really got, really got dicey during the Holocaust, for instance, and, uh, um, uh, the technocrats were not supposed to be communicating with each other. They, they were embedded in all the various columns of power that Hitler had established. And nobody was really supposed to communicate between those columns of power because Hitler, being paranoid that he was, wanted to keep everybody in the dark as to what the other side was doing so he could control everybody. And he wouldn't get any rebellion that way, you know, like people want to knock him off and, um, you know, take over the, the whole structure. But what this German historian found out is these technocrats continued to work within the German government and that they actually communicated um, secretly amongst themselves all during this period of time. And at the end of the war, it was also interesting. And, and these were the people, by the way, that, that b made the technology for Hitler to do what he did. Um, these are the people included, uh, you know, IBM and the machines they leased to the tabulators they leased to Germany. Um, this whole technocratic movement uh, made possible literally what Hitler did. If it were not for them, he, he would not have succeeded. They communicated with each other during the war <laughs> uh, between columns of power. This is now a, a matter of history. It's been documented in Germany. And uh, at the end of the war, you mentioned Operation Paperclip. At the end of the war, lots of interesting things happened. Most of the Military people and some of the politicians went off to Nuremberg, got tried, some of them died, some of them got long prison, service, prison terms. Uh, many um, uh, uh, German um, um, people who were accused uh, or would have been accused, they fled to other countries, like some many in South America, Argentina, for instance. And um, Operation Paperclip uh, was a top secret uh, uh, project back in those days only recently was just um, declassified and written about extensively. There was a book actually earlier, I think it was last year, called Operation Paperclip. And uh, what happened was that uh, our government, under top secret um, uh, operation, uh, brought some 1,600 scientists and engineers from Germany, from Nazi Germany, back to the United States. Uh, these were uh, inc these included the technocrats that were operating within <laughs> the Nazi experience all during that period of time. They never faced Nuremberg. They never faced charges. They basically were brought over here on um, you know to be sanitized, if you will, as far as uh, reputation is concerned and history. And they were uh, put into uh, top positions in military research labs. Um, uh, in some universities, uh, under contract uh, with the military, for instance. And they basically just went on with life as if nothing had happened in a different country. And this, this kind of brings up a principle I, that I see with, with, with technocrats in general. The technocrats and technocracy doesn't really care what political system it operates under. The political system is not the important thing to them. The methodology is. As long as their scientific method is being used, uh, the political ends to which it's used really don't matter. It's just that you use the correct... <laughs> the correct procedure to get there. Uh, that's why they had no problem, apparently, with the atrocious things that happened in Nazi Germany during the period of time. You say, well, do they have no conscience? Eh, maybe some did, but a lot of them didn't. They saw no problem with aiding and abetting, uh, you know, the extermination of hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And, you know, we talk about, you know, people talk about the Holocaust being about Jews, and it really was, but you know what? 
Hitler killed all the gypsies. He killed blacks. He killed Christians. <laughs> I mean, this guy was, this guy hated Jews for sure, but he was not a respecter of persons that that was the only target he had. He had, he didn't like anybody that wasn't like him. Um, I guess it's ironic that he wasn't even German. He's from Austria. <laughs> but the, the Germans didn't take that into account at the time. Um, but the German experience was really interesting with respect to technocracy. And uh, that's one of the reasons that technocracy failed in the United States, is that people too easily associated the American technocracy movement with Nazi Germany. And they said, we don't want any part of that. In fact, in Canada, technocracy was outlawed as a subversive, subversive organization for about, I think about two, two and a half years. Uh, that didn't help their reputation in America either, uh, that Canada had outlawed them. They didn't outlaw them here in the States, but um, a lot of people started scratching their heads thinking, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. So we just, you know, we don't want anything to do with those, those people. So technocracy starts at Columbia, it jumps the ocean, it goes over to Germany, it comes back over here with Operation Paperclip, and then the CIA takes the, those technocrats, those Nazi technocrats, and start running MK Ultra. So I don't know how deep your research has gone into it, but there's a relationship between technocracy and MK Ultra. And what do you know? Yeah. Well, there is, and and I'm not uh, I'm not the expert on that, by the way. I'll just say that up front. But uh, I have friends who know a lot about it, and um, they, you know most of the the science. Let's just talk about the science of it without putting a uh, you know moral value on it. Um, a lot of the science that came out of the atrocities in Nazi Germany. The experiments on humans, uh, some, some just so gross, you just don't even want to talk about them. But that, that created a body of science, you, you understand. The, the things that they did to people in the concentration camps, uh, um, with no respect to life or limb, um, that body of science came back to the United States when these, uh, when these uh, technocrats were repatriated. <laughs> I, I, this is pure speculation, but I wonder if they had a reunion party amongst technocrats in the United States and the technocratic buddies from Germany. I, I could picture that happening. I have no evidence that it ever happened. But they were welcomed back into the scientific community here with open arms. And all that science, all that body of science from these experiments came back into the United States. And science doesn't just go poof and dissipate. You know, knowledge just doesn't go poof and dissipate. Um, they brought it back in. It was part of their experience. It was part of their life. And even though they could not conduct additional experiments in the United States necessarily like they did in Nazi Germany, at least not so blatantly, um, it had a profound effect on a number of programs that the United States found itself operating with. And here we go. You know, the technocrats don't care what political system they're under as long as they can execute their trade. Okay, I wanna jump back and get a little of the historical context on these ideas. I would go back to the idea of Plato in his book, The Republic. There's a chapter on cybernetics and the, the art of steering and governing people. And though they didn't have really technology back then other than words. So rhetoric was the technocracy back then. If you wanna comment on that, and if not, jump to the first person in history, like. Uh, St. Simon, possibly, uh, that you see picking these ideas up and running with them. The, the, the ancient philosophy uh, from people like Plato, they danced around the idea of social control a lot. Whether there was a hardcore technology that they were looking at using to implement that, um, you know, other than just words, probably there wasn't a lot of technology that existed back then in, in the modern sense. Um, these philosophies have melded together. They've combined with other philosophers along the way and stuff to, to bring about the melting pot, I think, that we had in the early 1900s. I think it really found a nexus there. A lot of these trains of thought, you know, the French philosophers, for instance, that were writing many radical things. They incorporated bits and pieces of, of philosophy to justify their own uh, you know, manipulative positions of society and why society should be the way they say, not the way you know, maybe society really ought to be. Um, so you see this, mel there was a melting pot of, of, of various ideas in the early 20s. 
Some of them took the form of, uh, of uh, humanism, some took the form of communism, some took the form of fascism and socialism and so on. And uh, one of those prominent uh, progressive thoughts in science was scientism. And scientism um, as, a, um, as a philosophy, um, you, you can see some of like Plato's thinking in it, even though he didn't think it exactly this way, but uh, the father of technocracy is widely reputed to be a French philosopher. No, no surprise, it's a French philosopher probably. Uh, he lived between 1760 and 1825. Um, didn't live a super, super long life, I guess. Um, but he, was, he is considered uh, to be the father of technocracy, modern technocracy. And his philosophy was this, relating to scientism, he says, uh, and I quote, a scientist, my dear friends, is a man who foresees. Uh, it is because science provides the means to predict that it is useful, and scientists are superior to all other men, close quote. That's a dangerous, dangerous philosophy in my opinion, and there's multiple problems with this. Um, is a scientist actually able to foresee? That, does he have a crystal ball? Does he really know the future? Um, well, if you're somebody like Al Gore, who says we're all going to die because of climate change, <laughs> uh, uh, he's foretelling the future. You know, he's bought into this lie that he that, that somehow he can foresee the future, and he and he's telling us, "You better do it our, my way, or you're all going to die." The second thing is uh, that wrong with a statement like this, are scientists really superior to all other men? Uh, I would say no. They, they put their pants on uh, just like the rest of us, you know, the same way. They're men. They're subject to all the frailties of man and the mistakes of man. Uh, and they should never be elevated as some special class of superior men. Uh, this was very similar, by the way, not in uh, terms of scientists, but it's very similar to what um, what Hitler, you know, what Hitler had in mind for the Aryan race. He said the, the Aryan race, that is the Germ Germanic people, the blonde, blue-eyed, you know, strong, muscular supermen, that they were superior to all other men. You see, that's what started that whole thing, that they were, that somehow they were superior. And scientists are not superior to all other men. So scientism as a philosophy, um, uh, you know, an, a, an elite of scientists and engineers is a very dangerous philosophy because they take it upon themselves to engineer all of society uh, with no mandate from the people they're engineering, no input from the people they're engineering either. They're just doing it because they feel that they're enlightened. Uh, did St. Simon have any influence on communism and Marx and Engels, for instance? I'm sure that he did. Uh, but on the other hand, only only in the sense of a melting pot. You know, I, I don't see I don't see a lot of direct input from Saint Simon into uh, the the writings of Karl Marx, for instance. Um, but did it influence them to some extent? I expect it did. Uh, these were the things that were just being talked about in those days. You know, the uh, they didn't have. If people didn't have televisions to entertain them, <laughs> they didn't have, you, you know, sports games to go to every day of the week. Um, and what intellectuals would do is they would uh, they would read books actually, and they would talk about those books, and they you know they 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 debate philosophies and ideas and stuff like that, and they you know they'd come up with their own ideas out of a, you know hammering the other ones together. Um, and I expect that St. Simon was an inf influential uh, French uh, philosopher even in those days, and he was regarded. Uh, his, his number one disciple, by the way, was Auguste Comte, and um, he's known as the father of sociology, for instance, even today in college. You go to any sociology department and read about the history of sociology, the first name you're going to come across is Auguste Comte. So, uh, you know, they were influential. For sure, but you know, did everybody uh, take them in lockstep? No, uh, but the technocrats really revered Saint Simon. And they do to this day. Who, who came up with these ideas of positivism? Well, positivism 
Yeah, actually, who came up with it? It was an idea that came, that, that, that evolved from St. Simon and August Comte. Comte, I think, is credited with, with being the, the guy really that kind of fleshed out the, the idea of positivism. And both of these guys uh, were stuck on the idea of where does truth come from? How do we discover truth? And how can we know that truth is truth? <laughs> It seems a little bit like staring at your belly button, doesn't it, in a way? You know, it's like, well, I, I think, therefore I am. But they wanted, to, they wanted to debate the issue of where truth comes from. And uh, positivism, as it led into ultimately into scientism as well, believed that, that, uh, uh, that truth could only be determined according to uh, some other... Uh, hard science type of, uh, either through rationalism or through science. Uh, scientism really was kind of an extension of positivism in the sense that it excluded all other truth altogether other than science. Scientism says that only science can discover truth about man or reality and that there is no other truth. Well, this, this immediately rejects the entire Judeo-Christian ethic. It, it, it completely rejects the Bible as truth. Supernatural truth has no, uh, uh, no place anywhere in either of these philosophies. And so if man cannot discover through his own rational efforts what truth is, that there, there's no truth outside of that. Um, if you were to suggest to your wife, um, you know, well, honey, um, science says that um, you know, there really is no basis for love. Uh, so, you know, therefore, I guess, um, well, I guess I don't have to love you anymore. <laughs> you know, it's not going to fly. Uh, scientism can't explain things like love and, and uh, you know, other human emotions, uh, compassion um, and, you know, caring and jealousy and stuff like that. It cannot explain it, cannot begin to explain it. So the fact is there really is truth outside of scientism, outside of positivism, but they just don't acknowledge it. They feel it's just, you know, that's just irrational. Well, I think they're, they're, they're just looking at a slice and they're saying it's irrational because every day people are learning things. There's truth continuously being revealed through the use of one's soul in observing, identifying, organizing, and communicating in this world. And then, so, so, so the trickle-down precipitation of some of these ideas, uh, sociology, scientism, positivism, end up over in Prussia, and there's this cat named Wilhelm Wundt, who I met through chapter eight in Anthony Sutton's book uh, on skull and bones and, and education. And basically what you see is there's this Prussian, Prussian scientist, pseudoscientist, and he says that human beings have no soul, and therefore they work very much like clockwork oranges, and therefore they can be manipulated. And this is where outcome-based education comes from, which comes up to today's common core in its role in technocracy, because it's, it's the technology being used to kind of uh, give everyone the same kind of homogenized educational perspective that's very limited and based on artificial scarcity. I know that's a lot of words right there, but what do you think about it? I think it's, I think it's spot on. Um, you know, if you, if you remove God completely from the equation of truth, basically that leaves man to be nothing more than just a bag of atoms that have been somehow randomly put together to create a human being for, for some you know, period of time until you go dust unto dust. <laughs> and if you're just a bag of atoms, then your bag of atoms is no better than anybody else's. It's just, a, it's just something that happens. It's uh, um, uh, you know, something that should be managed. It's not something that should just be left to itself necessarily. And um, uh, you know, this, is, this is a very strange concept to most people when they really start thinking about it, but yeah, that's what it boils down to. Uh, they look at all of humanity uh, the, the scientists do that are involved in this scientism and technocracy idea and transhumanism as well. They look at the whole human experiment, if you will. Well, it's not an experiment, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, if, if all humans are just nothing more than a bag of atoms individually, then why not manage them? They're just like the, you know, like the koi in the koi pond out there. <laughs> you know, just, they're there to be managed. And somebody should stand up and manage them for Pete's sake. 
um, they have no social qualms about doing that on that basis. And, uh, you know, of course, a bag of atoms has no value. That, you know, theoretically, that would make you worth something like $32.42 for the, for the, you know, the chemical composition of your body. Should, could we melt you down or whatever? Um, but this is certainly not the value of man that we have historically, uh, you know, the value that was historically placed on man. And, uh, you know, the Bible as, a, as an instrument of truth, as a declaration of truth over the decades and centuries and millennia, um, <clears throat> has given a very high value to man as a creation of God, not as a creation of just pure chance and just random act, you know, random whatever, according to, you know, Darwin's theory. Um, but the man actually has a very high value, is created in the image of God, and so on and so on. Uh, this is totally rejected by scientism, positivism, and all the other isms as well. They're atheistic at best, they're humanistic, uh, meaning that humanism, meaning uh, the sum of all things, is, is wrapped up in man. Well, and if we all were bags of atoms, what would be the purpose or reason for life or death in the first place? Like, yeah, no, there'd be and, none. And if you don't need purpose or reason or any of these things, uh, I challenge you to just go spend a week in the wild because you're going to need reason. You're going to need some common sense. You're going to need patience. All these things that make us human beings and make us different from the squirrels. Yeah. You know, the great genocides of the last century have all been predicated on this this very thing that life has no value, and that they're just a bunch of uh, you know they're just excess cattle in the feedlot that you know need to be killed off because they're consuming too much or whatever. And, you know, you look at some of the big genocides that have happened, whether it be uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution or the, the Holodomor uh, or the, uh, uh, the Cambodian genocide um, killed some three million people. You say, how can, how can a government kill that, that, you know, those, the China, same thing. How can a government kill that many people and not have any conscience about it? <laughs> Yeah, I would have conscience about it, but the, the people that actually did the killing had no conscience about that. You know, what, what th 2 million, 3 million, 10 million, 30 million, whatever, uh, of your own citizens, they're just viewed as a, you're just a, just a bucket of atoms. You Pol Pot know, no would get rid of you and you, because you both got glasses. So Pol Pot would have gotten rid of you, right? <laughs> yeah. So this this trend in history i mean it didn't happen back in the time of saint simon or Compte or even robert owen but these ideas start to build up over decades and it's not the messengers who delivered those ideas those ideas are out there and they're neutral different generations in different parts of the world under different circumstances pick them up and start to use them in tools sometimes in not so friendly ways um i wanted to touch on robert owen in new harmony indiana and his uh do you know anything about the utopian colony there? I'm say, say it again to me now. Uh, Robert Owen, yeah. New Harmony, Indiana. He had set up. Uh, it was called yeah. New Harmony was the place. Right. Utopian right. socialism. Right. That um, uh, that um, uh, communist commune experiment was. Um, Let's see. What was the time frame of that again? What year was? I that? thought it was in the 1860s, maybe. Maybe what? Well, I wish Kevin Cole was here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a number of communes set up in, uh, in Canada um, to experience technocracy. Some of them are still around. Um, they don't know why they're around because they've lost their technocracy flavor. Uh, men have attempted utopian systems for a long time, uh, probably more, certainly more than 100 years back. Uh, none have ever worked out very well because they have a, a, a structure that forces the people to conform <laughs> within the utopian system. Um, there's no reason to believe, based on any utopian experiment, that it would work on a larger scale with any greater success. But the utopians of today... Um, you know, somehow still beating their heads, you know, against that same wall. But, oh, no, all we need to uh, all we need to do to succeed is just we just need to have a, a bigger system and, and more control. <laughs> and somehow that's going to make that's going to make the difference and it's going to make it possible to have, uh, you know, a good utopian system. But they, they've all failed. Every one of them has gone uh, 
you know, back to whatever. I don't know. They just they just flopped. And the ones that are up in uh, the, the technocracy experiments that were up in Canada, uh, as far as we could determine, none of them remember their technocratic roots. <laughs> they're just existing. They don't know why they're there. But yeah, Thorsten Veblen. I had become aware of him because of his uh, writings on conspicuous consumption. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later on, I realized that he, he was a writer for the Journal on Race Relations, mm -hmm. uh, Race Development, the Journal of Race Development. That became Council on Foreign Relations Foreign Affairs magazine. Mm -hmm. So Foreign Affairs Today came from that. Uh, some people thought it was a eugenics journal, but really it's about international relations. But if you get to international relations, that's kind of about eugenics as well. It's the control of other people uh, outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that's a sin to control someone other than yourself to have a slave mm -hmm. like that. Thorsten Veblen, what does he mean to history and how is his uh, work applicable through today? Well, Veblen was one of the instrumental technocrats that founded the technocracy movement in the 20s. Uh, were it not for Veblen, I'm not sure how the whole thing would have turned out at all, but he was really the glue that, that, that was binding the people together in the 20s. And um, <clears throat> although he, I believe he died prematurely before the actual birth of technocracy in 1932, uh, three and four, um, he was really kind of the main guy that proposed bringing all these, uh, these scientists and engineers together to talk about what he called a, uh, you know, a society or a, a, a Soviet of engineers. And uh, it was not communism. It was not socialism. What does Soviet Even mean? Even we called it a Soviet. Soviet just means a, a, a method of control. Um, using, in other words, using the engineering and science to control the society uh, that, that is pointed towards. And so he brought together people like Howard Scott and like M. King Hubbard. That's where they... Uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, Howard Scott was the, uh, the main disciple of Veblen. Um, he, he was like the guy that was always there, you know, to, to, to learn from him. And he took, a, he took almost every idea that Veblen put out and uh, even went further in some ideas as he got started with, uh, with his own independent technocracy incorporated movement. But uh, if, if it were not for Veblen, I doubt Howard Scott would have ever got to where he got. Oh, that's fascinating. Same thing with M. King Hubbard. Wow. So he was instrumental. Okay, so I think you're going to like this then. Uh, while Veblen's working for the Journal of Race Development, the Journal of Race Development was created in 1910 by G. Stanley Hall, who was a student of Wilhelm Wundt and also a member of Skull and Bones. I learned this all from a, a little tiny, see Sutton published his uh, Skull and Bones book in pamphlets. So when I first found this information, I'm looking in for the pamphlet. I paid 80 bucks for like whatever, 20 pages. And then I found out it's in his other book. It's like chapter eight in the bigger Skull and Bones secret establishment book. Uh, G. Stanley Hall is part of the Yale Troika of, of people who went overseas to be trained by Voigt to come back here and change our schooling system. And so now we have an overlap between Skull and Bones, technocracy, the Council on Foreign Relations, this idea of international relations. I think you're really onto something here. What can you say about uh, G. Stanley Hall or the influence of Skull and Bones? At the time, um, Skull and Bones was... Um a, a, an influential organization in the sense that it brought together uh, elite people to do, you know, secretive slash radical things in society. And back in the, from about 1900 up to 1935, maybe even 1940, uh, I view that as a period of radicalism, uh, a radical thought. Not, not radical in the sense just left wing, but uh, radical in the sense that, um, you know, shake them up philosophies. Everybody wanted to have some new thing. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to throw off the shackles of the old system, which is primarily based on religion and divine inspiration and so on. And they wanted to do something radically new. And I think a lot of that could be uh, laid at the feet of Charles Darwin, for instance, who really uh, stirred the pot uh, with his Origin of Species and book and, you know, got people to thinking. And then communism came along. Karl Marx uh, uh, proposed uh, uh, just some radical, radical ideas that, that people were talking about. And um, 
you know, the whole eugenics thing was floating around in those early days as well. Um, there was a competition. I, I view it as a competition uh, amongst thinkers to want to come up with the newest thing. You know, the newest, most radical possible thing that they could that they could think up. And I think a lot of them talked in that way. You know, like, wow, you know, so and so, you know, Karl Marx got, you know, he 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 got all this stuff about, you know, the the basis for communism. But, you know, let's do something different. Let's think up some other cockeyed philosophy <laughs> and see if we can make it stick and we throw it at the wall. Um, so, you know, you had technocrats thinking that way in the early days, you know, let's do something new. Let's not just take everything that's out there, but, you know, let's invent some new thing. And, um, uh, you know, the eugenics movement was, was not a, a broad-based movement uh, for sure, but it sure was testy, I'll say that, as far as being radical, having, you know, really far out ideas and stuff. It was really off the wall, back, even back for those days. And um, so you see, you see the overlap between uh, people involved with technocracy, like I said earlier, um, and eugenics. It doesn't mean that eugenics was organically hooked to technocracy when, when, um, when uh, Howard Scott and, and uh, Hubbard actually formed the organization in 1934. But the influence is obviously there. Uh, there was a 19th century author named Edward Bellamy who wrote a book called Looking Backward. How did that affect uh, the big box store culture we see today? It was a huge book back in those days and continued uh, well into the uh, last century. And th the book essentially uh, was kind of a story of Rip, Rip Van Winkle type story where a guy went to sleep uh, or was in a coma or whatever for a hundred years and he woke up and he goes outside and goes, whoa, what's, the, you know, what's going on here? And all of it, you know, like a time traveler and he, uh, he awakes in this new utopian world and he's looking backwards to see how things have changed since uh, he was alive on, on planet Earth. And uh, it was very much a picture of technocracy and, and uh, uh, you know, utopian system that had evolved on Earth. And it, was, uh, it wasn't exactly a science fiction book, um, but it had a wide, wide appeal just because the way it was written. Uh, people just went nuts over it. And the book had a large influence on a number of people during the early 1900s uh, because of that. You know, it was visionary. It was looking, you know, it was really looking forward. Um, that is, it was kind of progressive in its, in its nature. And I'm sure that a lot of different groups that were talking different things, including the technocrats, um, had a stake in that book somewhere in that whole idea that, you know, hey, we're planning the future here. You know, we're going to direct the future. We're going to be the future. And whoever gets to the future first is going to be the ones that wins the future, I guess. So, you know, the communists, they wanted to... They wanted to get their future, and uh, the technocrats wanted their future, and the fascists wanted their future, and and you know everybody was vying for what what was going to be the final, you know, the state of the world, and um, so um, uh, this book had a I think had a profound effect on a number of people for different reasons, not not all the same, but I think a lot of people looked at it and said, wow, this is, you know, this is uh, we need to think about the future and then look at it kind of from a backwards point of view, how we're going to get there. Well, and I think maybe one of the readers of that book was a young Herbert George Wells as he was studying under yes. T.H. Huxley, and he's like, wait yeah. a minute, this time travel thing is interesting, because he wrote The Time Machine, and then he wrote uh, uh, War in the Air, which was 1907, which predicts mm -hmm. World War I, mm -hmm. and then he wrote a whole bunch mm -hmm. of other stuff, New World Order, the New Machiavellis. How does he fit in, or did his artistic stylings uh influence technocracy, do you think, or is, how do you think that? Interacted? I don't think so. I don't think so necessarily. Um, engineers and scientists, especially the ones that exist at, at, um, uh, at Columbia University, and, and, and by the way, I'm thinking probably half of those people that I remember by name were German. <laughs> they have German extraction. And they very much had an idea <clears throat> of uh, not invented here syndrome. Um, they wanted, what they wanted to do they wanted to be their particular invention. And that, 
engineers are just kind of that way in general. I don't want to, I really don't mean to stereotype all engineers, but um, for the ones that have this mindset that they're superior to all other men, if an idea didn't come from them, it basically is no good. <laughs> you know, so you know, that's why we see somebody like Al Gore hanging on to global warming when maybe even the evidence is it might be going the other way. In fact, they used the same war, the, the same technique back in the 70s when they called for global cooling. We were all going to die because the world was going into an ice age. <laughs> and that didn't work out too well. <laughs> so we didn't go into an ice age. So they turned it around and said, well, it's global warming. We, we got that wrong. It's not global warming. We're all, we're all going to die because the seas are going to rise. And, um, you know, well, it's, it, yeah, it, 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 it's, kind of, it's kind of a crazy... Um, well, well, it's a sales pitch. Al Gore is pitching yeah. you on a story so he can buy beachfront property at low price. Yeah. I've seen that happen <clears> before. <throat> yeah. Fabian socialism and technocracy. Is there any connection? Is there any cross influence? Are there cross memberships? The difference between Fabian socialism and technocracy, again, uh, harkens back to uh, how the economic system works. Technocracy was not proposed as a political management or a political system uh, or a political form of government. Whereas Fabian socialism basically merged the corporate world with the governmental system, wh whatever that might be, um, whether it was Nazi Germany or whether it was uh, Mussolini, um, even the president of Columbia University had ideas on, on Fabian socialism and probably would have liked to have seen it in the United States. Um, but it's still based on a price, it, it presumes a price-based economic system, nevertheless. Supply and demand, um, you know, using a currency to exchange goods and services. You still had uh, various limits of private and personal property involved in, in all those systems. Technocracy proposed to do away with the price-based system altogether. So on one hand, even though you can see some kind of structural similarities between a totalin the totalitarian system of technocracy versus the totalitarian system of, of fascism, they're different. And where they're different is, the, is how they, at the, at the very bottom of the economic system, one has supply and demand capitalistic eco economics, and the other has uh, no supply and demand, uh, an energy-based or resource-based economic system. And they're otherworldly to each other. They, you, you can't describe them in the, same, in, the, you know, in, in the same sentence because they don't fit in the same sentence. They just, they're otherworldly concepts. Um, I'll say, by the way, people are wondering today why the world economically is upside down. There's things happening in the world today that fit no economic model that I ever studied, uh, you know, 45, 50 years ago in college. Uh, they just don't work anymore. Pe pe economists are scratching their head trying to write new laws and new, you know, new things to explain what's going on in the world. It doesn't fit. Nobody, to my knowledge, in the, in the economic world has considered that there are two economic systems fighting for control over the whole world right now. One is capitalism and one is technocracy. One's going to die and one's going to live. The question is, which one? Will capitalism survive or will it be truly supplanted with technocracy? Because the two economic systems are just, they're, they're not even oil and water. They're worse than that. <laughs> they, they cannot exist. It's almost like matter and antimatter. They cannot exist in the same space. One will die and one will live. 